Alright, welcome back to a modest analysis of Gladiator Guild Manager. This is part two. And I'd like to preface this, since it's going to sound like I'm being very critical, that I would not be covering this game if I didn't find it interesting, and if I didn't see a lot of potential. And that being said, let's get right into it. So, first thing that caught my attention when playing it was that there is too much downtime. So, when you're just waiting, any time there's a game where you're just waiting for the next time you get to play, that's a problem. So, I feel like it's an effort to keep the player from just spamming the arena of death and grinding, making the championships too easy, uh, and to make the, the quests when they pop up more interesting, which is fine. But, right now, the, the arena of death is really the sticking point for me. Because it has so much potential to allow you to play the game while you're waiting for the gladiators to update, for the items to update, for the quests to come about. So, if the core loop of the game is dropping gladiators into combat and watching them fight, there should be less time between instances of dropping gladiators into combat and watching them fight. Worth noting here, watching gladiators recover after they fall in combat is much, much, much more interesting than just watching the timeline progress while all your gladiators are completely good to go. Second point, if you can't get a set of gladiators that ever win, you're locked into a failed run. If you make bad choices or get unlucky with the gladiator market, you just potentially keep dropping them into the arena of death and losing, and get nothing. So, if you're just either waiting for the gladiator market to refresh so that you can get decent gladiators, in part because it's prohibitively expensive to refresh it early in the game. But if you're just waiting, uh, say you only get one good gladiator, or one gladiator you want to purchase in the first market, you just have to wait for, I think it's a week, before the gladiator market refreshes. Doing nothing. And if you do make poor choices, like if you just buy three archers, then you're not going to succeed. Uh, in, in the arena of death, the blind fight, you're probably just going to lose over and over. And there's also the chance that you'll get quests that you just can't complete because you chose your gladiators poorly. And if the player doesn't build an optimal starting team, there's a good chance, say they buy, you know, three berserkers or three archers or whatever. Uh, there's a good chance, since the only way to make money is to drop them into fights, that they just can't win, and by not being able to win, they can't get more gold to buy new gladiators to not have a suboptimal team anymore once they start getting the hang of the game or, you know, start learning from their mistakes. They have to just completely restart the game, which might be the intent. The, the developers might actually want that to be a situation where if you make bad choices early on, you just have to restart. But on that point, if you can't win fights, there's no progression. You don't gain experience. If, you're, if your gladiators all die without killing anything, you gain no experience. If you lose, you gain no gold. And it's just that there's absolutely no progression if you start off poorly. However, as the game progresses, that's not an issue anymore. It doesn't matter if you have a suboptimal team if you're overleveled for the championship you're fighting in. So, the core loop is fun, but sitting and waiting for your gladiators to recover after losing fight after fight is frustrating, and I fear there is a chance that a new player may just refund the game instead of restarting and, and starting over from scratch. And that would be a shame, because the game does offer a significant amount of enjoyment. So the idea is you want to always soften that initial hurdle, that initial bump, that whenever a player drops into the game, you don't want the first thing they do to be the hardest thing. You want to progress with difficulty, no matter what type of game it is. You never want the first experience your player has to potentially be the hardest thing they do in the entire game, which is currently what the first five to ten minutes of play 
sadly is. Once you do get the hang of it, it smooths out the difficulty curve a lot. Even if you're starting a new playthrough, once you get the hang of things, it's much easier once you get the hang of things. So the difficulty curve isn't the issue. The issue is just that that first immediate hurdle that players who are unfamiliar with the game face when they drop in is an issue. That's, that's the issue, is you can drop into the game with no prior knowledge of the game, lose horribly over and over, get nothing, get no progression, and feel like you just wasted your time. And again, that could result in a, in a player refunding the game instead of trying it again. So, point four, there is no point to having more than one or two teams. The, the way the game currently exists, you really just level up one team, maybe with a couple of gladiators you swap in or out based on your matchups. And if you're not using this one team of gladiators with a couple to swap in and out, then the others fall behind, and you end up just selling them. So, your the, the fighters that you never use, never get experience, never level up, and then you just don't use them. It's a, it's a cycle there. So, since that's the case, the expansion of gladiator slots beyond about 8 is kind of useless. It, there's no reason really to spend your resources to expand past around 8 gladiators, because that gives you your primary team of four or five, and then a couple that you can swap in and out based on matchups. So, team composition is kind of a big part of the strategy of the game, and because of the way the progression of each individual gladiator works, you don't really get to really think out that team composition aspect of the strategic part of the game. The, the strategy that, oh, we're against this type of enemy, we should be using this type of gladiator, falls flat when your choice is, do I use gladiators that are better against them, or do I use gladiators that are twice the level? And oftentimes, if you have high enough level gladiators, it just doesn't matter what you're against. You just drop in your best team, watch them kill everything, and move on. And if, if that fails at any point, you just level up your gladiators in the arena of death, or just redoing the championship a couple times, doing quests, whatever. You just level up your primary team until the point where they are high enough level to just win regardless of what they're up against. Building on that point, the results of the championships are very binary. Either you win the battle and you progress, even if it does cost you a couple of gladiators, but if you lose, if, if all your gladiators fall, you just, you're out. You're done. So, one one unfortunate circumstance, one point where the AI does something unexpected that ruins your strategy and results in a loss, or if you just have a primary team that just happens to be completely hard countered by every option that you have to face, you just have to wait till the next month to try the championship again. There, There is no underdog story. There's no, oh, that didn't work, so... Maybe if I use these other gladiators that I have in reserve, I can eke out a win and barely make it through this championship. You get you get to the final battle of the championship and you just get unlucky, or again the AI does something silly and you lose, and then you have to wait another month to try again. The permadeath option is an opportunity to make the game infinitely replayable. However, it is largely unplayable right now and the majority of runs have to just be restarted within the first month or two. And that stems from all those previous points I just made. In addition to the fact that when a gladiator dies, if a single gladiator dies, you permanently lose potentially considerable amounts of progress. Especially if that single gladiator was part of, as mentioned previously, your primary team, and all you have other than it is underleveled gladiators. So... The pain points of the permadeath mode can actually be fixed pretty easily, I believe, and you'll, I'll cover my suggestions in a, in a moment. And a lot of those suggestions of how to fix the previous points will actually largely fix the permadeath issue, the, the issue of why permadeath is so hit or miss right now. And the financial management system is definitely not designed for the permadeath mode. Simple fix that I didn't include below just to toss out would be if there's some kind of blood sport or um, or consolation prize, 
whenever you lose gladiators, perhaps with permadeath mode, you can refund the player a percentage of what purchasing a gladiator of that level would cost. But this this is a campaign management and economic issue. It can be fixed in many ways, but right now the developers seem, rightly so, to be focusing on the standard way to play, and permadeath is just kind of a side option that's not getting a lot of attention from them. Um, but a permadeath-only blood sport reward would be a great way to soften the blow to your run if you lose one of your top gladiators. If you lose a level 20 gladiator, but you're refunded a percentage of the purchase cost of a new level 20 gladiator, you won't just outright lose the run because you got wiped in one battle. So, moving on, point seven. The gladiator market does not have a considerable difference between gladiators with no quirk, good quirks, or bad quirks. There, there is no reason to pick gladiators that don't have good quirks. The gold difference, I believe, is like 10%, if even, one way or the other. And that's a problem. In addition to the, the gold cost not being significant enough, to buy a good quirk or a bad quirk gladiator. The number of quirks are very limited. I understand the game is in beta, so maybe this is something that they intend to work on in the future, but the number of quirks has a large impact on whether or not a player is willing to accept a bad quirk or a gladiator with no quirks, because if they're likely to see certain quirks the first or second time that the gladiator market refreshes, they are liable to just wait for those good quirks. As compared to if there's, just throwing a number out that's crazy, a thousand different quirks, then there's no guarantee even a player who's intimately familiar with the game would never be able to count on a certain quirk coming up at all during the entire playthrough. So that means they would consider quirks that they consider, you know, less good. They, they would consider gladiators with no quirk at all if they are not offered any good quirks. If, if all the gladiators other than the one with no quirks are bad quirks because there's such a large variety of quirks, then perhaps they'd be more willing to buy a basic gladiator. But that ties in, again, to the economic side of things where if buying a gladiator with a bad quirk is just not worth the gold you're saving, you're never going to do it. Um, in addition, the larger number of quirks would make low-level gladiators with a quirk you really like worth putting the effort into to level up, even if they're, say, level 1 when your highest level gladiators are level 10. You might want that one quirk that you haven't seen again on that gladiator, so you might spend the time to get that level 1 gladiator caught up. In my opinion, it would also be best to have different tiers of quirk. For example, there's already light smoker versus heavy smoker in the game, but further increasing or decreasing the cost and wage of a gladiator based on the tier of quirks they have could do uh, amazing things for, if I'm going to be able to buy a gladiator for a certain price that has no quirks, or I can buy two gladiators that both have half the wage of the standard gladiator, and they both have negative quirks, I would be more inclined to buy those gladiators as compared to essentially having the same wage and costing, again, less than 10% difference. You're never going to want to buy a gladiator with a negative quirk. It's just, it's not worth it. It's, it's not an interesting decision to make. There is no decision to make. It's just objectively bad to save 10 or 15 gold to get a gladiator with a horrible quirk. All right, and moving on. Agility. Agility is problematic in the current implementation of the game. So since every class benefits from agility in cooldown and execution time, every single class, their cooldown and execution time is entirely dependent on agility, there is never a situation where giving a gladiator agility is bad ever, because it's always going to make them act faster and more frequently. 
which is a multiplicative increase of whatever it is that they're doing, the Berserker kicking people down more frequently and faster, the Pyromancer, who you would think wants intelligence, but no, actually, putting agility on so incredibly reduces the cooldown and increases the the speed with which they throw out their first fireball, that I would rather have a max agility or, or cap agility pyromancer with no intelligence just for the fact that it crowd controls so many people so quickly at the start of a fight. I don't care that it does no damage. It doesn't need to do damage. It does its job by just knocking everyone around and letting my champion or my, my gladiators that have damage kill them while they're on the ground. So it's very counterintuitive that you want to put agility on a pyromancer instead of intelligence. So I understand they probably did this because, you know, the thought is, oh, agility makes you faster. But it's a missed opportunity to use a player's suspension of disbelief to make the stat choices more meaningful. Nobody goes to a strategy game and says, I want this to be a one-to-one representation of reality. Nobody plays an RPG and says, oh, having wisdom increase the ability to cast, you know, holy spells is unrealistic. It does, doesn't matter. What matters is that the choices that you make in the game are meaningful. And in addition to that, who says strength can't make you swing your axe faster? Or intelligence allowing you to, to block more effectively and efficiently? I mean, there's there's no reason why non-agility stats can't make something function faster. Can't can't make the execution time shorter or the cooldown. Like having higher strength means that you can swing faster and more often than if you had less strength. And also for every game developer who may be seeing this, whether they're novice, experienced, I don't care. Never be afraid to make abilities scale with less than normal stats. Like, movement speed, yes, moving faster is good. But it's more interesting if you increase your character's movement speed and it increases their ability to do X, Y, or Z other thing. Increasing somebody's health, yes, it makes them less likely to die. It makes them harder to kill. But it makes it more interesting if increasing their health also, say, increases the vigor with which they block attacks. So, just because a stat already does a thing, doesn't mean it can't do other things to make it more interesting. Now, obviously, you don't want it to be set up so that building health also increases your damage and attack speed and everything the most. That would be bad, because then there would be no reason to build anything other than health. But having health marginally increase other things makes it more interesting than just giving you more damage you can absorb. Especially in a game like Gladiator Guild Manager, where the majority of classes of Gladiator have some kind of ability that mitigates damage. So, for example, the Warg has its dodge ability. Giving the Warg agility gives it effective health, because it's able to dodge faster and it's able to dodge more damage. So you're literally getting attack and damage and speed of attack, as well as effective health when you give a ward agility. So why can't giving it health also give it something else to make it more interesting of a decision than just oh, I'm going to just max out this warg's agility and just give it a couple points of health here and there when I have to because it's dying too fast. So the more scaling you have throughout your mechanisms in a game, the more levers you have to adjust for balance purposes. That is a key point that I feel like a lot of game developers just miss. The more that each stat does the more things you have to tweak. Moving on. Gladiator Guild Manager leans towards imperfect balance. They still seem to be trying to balance the stats and classes. But 
it seems like it would be much more successful if there were a way to modify the classes in AI so that there were just flat out counters. For example, if you could hypothetically tell your archer to target the back line and then only have the missiles intercepted if there is a frontliner standing between the archer and the target. I don't know if the, the archer's arrows are, you know, calculated by ray casts or something, but it, there are ways when you're programming the way things work to have more interesting nuance to the strategy than just the AI is going to do AI things and it either does what you expected it to do and things are fine, or it does something incredibly stupid and you're frustrated that the AI ruined your plan. And if the stats were more, more determined by your class, like the, the Dungeons & Dragons system, ever since the original Dungeons & Dragons, has had this stat pattern where each class has certain stats that it needs to function well. Some stats that it's cool to have, but not necessary, and some stats that are just completely useless. The go-to example is fighters. Fighters like strength. It makes them hit better, more frequently, and harder. Fighters also like constitution, because it gives them more health. A secondary stat for a fighter is dexterity, because up to a point, dexterity helps them you know, reduce the damage they take by increasing their armor class. But if they're wearing heavy armor, pretty much every system of Dungeons and Dragons since the beginning has had some kind of imp implementation where having dexterity on a heavily armored fighter is less ideal than having strength or constitution. And then pretty much if you're playing a fighter, you don't care about wisdom, intelligence, or charisma. Those are all dumb stats. You can have those low. I mean, especially older Dungeons & Dragons systems, you didn't want them too low because there were other things that relied on it. Again, the more stuff tied into a stat, the more interesting the decisions when it comes to developing stats are. But you still had the ability and the and incentive to choose a couple stats to prioritize and let the others just suffer. So, in the example of Gladiator Guild Manager, the warg is currently, I, as far as I can tell, designed as a hard counter to archers and mages because it tries to run past the front line and kill the squishies in the back. And to facilitate that concept, they are usually higher damage, lower health, and faster moving. And right now, because the AI is so hit or miss, if the warg does run to the back line and dodge all the frontliners, he very successfully kills everything unless they're just, you know, above, you know, way over leveled compared to him. And likewise, the archers being countered by the knights, where the knights just block all the archers' damage so easily while they run at them and cut them down. It only matters if the archers fire on the knights. If the archers decide to shoot the back line, then it doesn't matter that you dropped in a couple knights in front of the archers. The archers are just ignoring them. So I have no immediate suggestions for how to fix this, because it is an AI primarily an AI situation. But uh, the, the one thing that does come to mind that would help alleviate a lot of this is if the player were able to designate targets or priorities or something to his gladiators before the battle starts. And then see what the AI does with it. Um, whereas the enemies, it, it could be you know, certain certain gladiators could be designed to fight front to back and others back to front and all sorts of things in between. There's there's a lot of opportunity for space for changes to be made to improve the, again, imperfect balance. And in case one of my previous rants on the topic have been missed, uh, imperfect balance, an example, is rock, paper, scissors. No, nothing is the strongest because everything is strong against something and is weak to something. So rock is always going to be equal to other rock, weaker than other paper, and stronger than other scissors. And because all of the options have those strengths and weaknesses that balance each other out, it is imperfectly balanced. And the, the more developers lean towards imperfect balance, I feel like the healthier and stronger the game becomes. 
as compared to games where they try to lean towards perfect balance, where each choice you make is viable against every other choice that the enemies can make. It's just, it's much harder to pull off successfully, and generally there's at least some degree of failure. And I'm not saying that the solution is to just have certain choices in a game completely and outright ruin other choices. Just having them stronger than something and weaker than something is is ideal if you're trying to get a well-balanced game. Um, there are very balanced games. Uh, a, an example of a game that did balance, just, just perfect balance correctly or well, uh, is the original Warcraft Orcs and Humans. So the Orc and Human races that you could choose between in war in the original Warcraft were almost identical. All of their low tier and mid tier units were just mirrors of each other. Same stats, just a different character model. That's it. But then once you got to the highest tier of units, there were differences. The the orcs were more focused on destruction and death, and the humans were more focused on protection and healing. So the highest level units were balanced against each other specifically because every other unit that was supporting them were completely perfectly balanced. Now, it did make the game much less interesting than something similar like StarCraft. StarCraft had, at the very very beginning, imperfect balance between the Zerg, the humans, or the uh, Terrans, and the Protoss. So the Protoss were really good against the Terrans, because they had very few units that were very strong. The Terrans were kind of the neutral ground that were weak against the Protoss and strong against the Zerg, because they had more units than the Protoss, but they were weaker, and they usually had longer ranges. And then the Zerg was strong against the Protoss and weak against the humans, because they also, similar to the Protoss, had shorter ranged units, but they had so many that they could just swarm the Protoss and overwhelm them with numbers. So there was imperfect balance, which is part of the reason why StarCraft blew up as big as it did when it was first launched, is because we had moved from games like Command and Conquer and Warcraft that were trying to have perfect balance, and even Command and Conquer to some degree had a little bit of imperfect balance with different unit choices between factions, but I'm getting way off topic now. Uh, the, the single point I'm trying to make is just imperfect balance for a game like Gladiator Guild Manager should be the goal, because otherwise the devs will drive themselves insane trying to develop a perfectly balanced game. The items of Gladiator Guild Manager could be subdivided into more tiers, allowing for more gradual progression and better pricing systems. The consumables could also use a balance pass, and the diversity of items could be increased. Uh, because early game, when you first start the game, having items that literally double, triple, or quadruple a stat for a gladiator are far stronger than they should be. Early game items that increase stats less would make selection and level of gladiator much more interesting for the early game fights. And making the decision of whether to buy an early game item or hold off until better are available would be more meaningful. Since this is a beta, I'm not sure if it's on the list of things for the devs to look at, but uh, I'm definitely going to give an example uh, when we get to part B of this video. So, on that note, consumable items really are bad compared to permanent items right now in the game. And I believe I actually hit on that. Yes, they do. Okay, I will get to that in a moment. A compliment for the game, it does an excellent job of allowing the player to analyze the stats for each class and seeing exactly what they scale with and how much they scale. Uh, the only change I would make there is including the exact scaling amount for execution time and cooldown, because right now they just give a total effect from the stats the Gladiator has. But you, you can calculate out, oh, he's got 7 agility and the execution time is reduced by 0 0.07, so obviously it's agility times 0 0.01. But having that just explicitly stated would be nice. Uh, the building upgrades are very drastic changes. Again, granularity would be very good in this situation. 
instead of each step increasing the item slot by two and only having two upgrades, it would be far better for the game, especially as the run progresses, to still have forms of progression available to have one item slot per upgrade, but having four or five upgrades instead of just two. When failing a quest, uh, the, the quests are separated into basically lethal and non-lethal, um, peaceful and I forget what the other one's called. But when failing a quest, if none of your gladiators get injured or have any kind of cooldown, then uh, as I believe I messed around with in part one, you can just keep purposely losing but getting a kill or two during the course of the quest and just grind experience and, and abuse it. But when succeeding at a quest, uh, the gladiators that fell during the peaceful quests are still injured. So it seems counterintuitive that both are true. So if it's a peaceful quest, I would recommend never injuring gladiators, which again would be abusable, or injuring them whether the player succeeds or fails at the quest. So the latter fits better with other mechanisms of the game and would feel more correct and prevent the abuse case that I suggested. Or that I pointed out. Uh, it would also give the player more pause to consider the quest before just throwing their gladiators in. An example of this is there's there's a quest further on in the game uh, where I think it's like a level 20 or 40 or some some large level monster that I had no reason not to drop gladiators in against. Like I was just like, okay, here we go. And they failed, but it was no big deal. So I tried again with different gladiators, still failed. So I was like, okay, whatever, I'll just pass on this quest then. But there was never a moment of pause in deciding whether or not to take the quest of, oh, if I lose this, my gladiators are going to be out for, I think at the time, they were like level 10-ish. So they would be down for 20 days if I fail at this. There, that was not a consideration. I just knew that if I failed the quest, oh well, nothing bad happens. So it would make the quests more interesting to have them still injure the gladiator, or if permadeath is enabled, still kill the gladiator on failure. It makes it so that the quests are more interesting to decide between whether or not I want to try it. And as we'll discuss later, that... That could also just, instead of being outright injuring them, some kind of short, like, one or two day cooldown of whether, you know, where they're not available for quests because they're whatever. Point 14. Never having the enemies in a championship use items creates an issue. A very big issue where there is no challenge if you have your gladiators. Like, even, even if your gladiators are a little bit underleveled, if you have six items on each of your gladiators, you don't care that they're underleveled. But if you were to give items to the enemies in championships based on whether it's the green, blue, or purple reward battle, like, if every purple reward enemy had at least one or two items, it would make it more of a decision of whether to go for the easy, medium, or hard fights. The bank is excellent. Trading materials is a necessity to balance out RNG whenever you have any kind of management game. So if you have different material types, there has to be some mechanism to trade between those items. Uh, so if you have any kind of resource that is randomly distributed especially, there has to be some way to transfer from one resource to another, and the bank does an excellent job of doing that. You can buy and sell goods, so you can decide how much of what that you need, sell the rest for gold, and buy whatever other resource you need. But adding in a loan mechanic would be very interesting for the bank, where if the player accepts a loan, they get some amount of gold and then at a later time lose a larger sum of gold, just the way loans work. So if early game, the player could choose to take out a 150 gold loan and buy an additional gladiator, and then 14 days later pay 200 gold, then it might 
it might add another layer of depth to the economic simulation part of the game. And especially since gold values can drop into the negatives, <laughs> the developers could just force you to repay the loan, whether you're ready to or not. But it, it definitely would make things more interesting whenever you're just shy of getting this one gladiator or this one item that you really want to bring into the next fight. But you don't have enough gold, so you just take out a loan, and you hope you win the next fight to make up the difference between the gold that you borrowed and the gold you have to pay back. It would also allow prices to be adjust, adjusted much more recklessly. Uh, again, I'm a big fan of having a bunch of levers whenever you're adjusting stats and parts and aspects of a game, because the more things you can adjust, the easier it is for the developer to make a fair and balanced and enjoyable experience. So even if the gold prices for items, for example, are just higher than reasonable, or you know, just higher than what the player expects, they can just take out a loan and still buy the item they want. And yeah, it, it might be longer before they can afford another item, but they got that item they wanted. So it, it's just, it makes it more forgiving to adjust gold prices on things when you can just go to the bank and get more gold at will with the trade-off that at some point you're going to lose the gold or lose extra gold. So here's the point that I was waiting for earlier. Consumables take an item slot. However, it is objectively better to buy and use permanent items than consumables. In addition to that, once you have every item slot on a gladiator full, there's no purpose to consumables beyond selling them and buying more permanent items that are better than the ones you currently have. Having a permanent plus 10 to agility is always going to be the smarter purchase than buying six minor agility potions that give plus eight each for the same price. So you get less agility per battle, unless you're using two of the potions at a time. And once you've fought six battles, you're just out. You, you don't have anything. At the 10 agility permanent item, you can sell again, but the potions are gone. So if you get a better item, you're worse off having bought the six agility potions to use in a single championship that has six battles than just buying the plus 10 agility item. I do include an a example later that addresses this. But uh, you, you always want to make sure that purchasing consumable items in any game, no matter where it is, no matter what you're developing, consumable items should always, they, they come with an inherent risk-reward built into them. The risk is that if you don't accomplish your goal using the consumable, you lost it. It's gone. It didn't help you after all. The benefit is it might help you overcome a challenge that you otherwise wouldn't have been able to. So, if there's an alternative option that allows you to overcome the same challenge or a harder challenge that isn't permanently gone after you overcome the challenge, there's no reason to use consumables. And that literally goes for any game that has consumables. Moving on from that, uh, the timeline pauses automatically for championships, but when you exit the championship, it resumes at the same speed before the championship. So, if you're, if you're double-timing the timeline just to get to the championship already, then once the championship ends, you can lose a couple days of potential uh, arena of death battles or whatever just because you didn't have it, you weren't ready for it to resume so quickly right after the championship. So it's a minor thing. Uh, it, it's really a quality of life tweak more than anything, but just having the championship pause at the end of it, or having the timeline pause at the end of a championship would give the player time to spend the gold and resources that they just got from the championship, or decide they don't want to and just click play, or, you know, cl click the play or fast forward buttons themselves. It's it's just a minor quality of life thing. The one versus one ring of death battles never seem to include ranged gladiators. I I spent several hours with the game, and I never once saw a single one versus one battle in the ring of death that included a ranged gladiator. They were all just melee or hybrid melee ranged. That's it. So I could never drop one of my ranged gladiators in the one-on-one -on -one battle. It just, it was melee only. I, I could only drop in melee characters. So you have to drop the ranged gladiators into either a championship or the blind fight. 
and if they're underleveled, again, they just die. And if they instantly die, they get no experience, and again, we get back to that same progression issue. And it's it's even worse with permadeath mode. Like, permadeath mode, you don't want to touch the blind fight at all. Because there's just too much of a risk of getting wiped because something unexpected was waiting for you in the darkness. But even with the standard mode, it's still a consideration that if there's no other way to level up your gladiator than to drop it in a blind fight and it just instantly dies, you might as well sell the gladiator. Because it'll never be able to catch up. And then the last minor thing is it's too easy to accidentally buy items in Gladiators via right-clicking instead of left-clicking. Um, I actually did that several times while I was getting the hang of the game of I went to left-click, or I, I thought I was going to check the stats and I right-clicked and accidentally bought the Gladiator. And then if you go to revive a Gladiator with the Mana Crystal, it's really easy to accidentally click the Sell button in part because for some reason... You might think, oh, the close button's on the right side of the screen instead of the left. So you click revive and then click sell trying to close out of the window and you just sold the gladiator you revived. So you're out the gladiator and the revive crystal. So just having a confirmation dialogue is amazing. It's it's very important. It's It's a minor annoyance sometimes to some people, but... If it ever, at one point, just stops you from accidentally making a mistake, like buying a gladiator or item or selling a gladiator that you didn't intend to, then it's worth all the annoyance. If you don't want to implement a confirmation dialogue, just a buyback or sellback option is a great standby. If you if you have a list of gladiators you just sold on the side of the screen that you can buy back for the same price you sold them for, or if you're able to instantly, before closing the Gladiator or item shop window, if you're able to just sell back whatever you just bought for the same price you paid for it, that works too. But the confirmation dialogue is really much easier to implement. So now we're going to get to solutions for everything except for the last couple of little small tweak suggestions. So this is, this is part B of the Mazda analysis, and this is the part where... Hopefully, the developers like some of my suggestions and maybe use them. And this is also the part where people might disagree heavily with the suggestions and changes that, I, that I'm suggesting here. Um, but it's, again, this is a thought experiment. This is a way to change things to be different, better, worse, however, and... Really, the only way to know for sure whether it's good for the game or not is to test it, is to implement something and test it. You can't ever just look at a game and go, oh, no, that's terrible. Like, there, there's just, there's so many examples in games that if they had decided not to try to implement something, they wouldn't have stumbled across a gem. And that's about all I have to say until we move forward, so... Here are su suggested changes that I have for Gladiator Guild Manager. The uh, first major change is the Arena of Death. So, instead of Blind Fight being unlocked first, if the solo duel, the one versus one, is unlocked first, it actually helps a lot with a lot of the issues. Especially if the solo duel is able to have ranged Gladiators, then... A, it helps players learn, like, new players can more easily learn what types of units are strong against other units. It gives the players a chance to progress, even if they can't get a good team together, uh, whether from mismanagement or bad luck. So if they do pick three archers, and they go into solo duels, and they keep dropping their archers in, and the knight just kills them, the berserker just kills them, and then an archer, they kill each other. And, like, it just, it's there's more chance to progress, there's more chance to learn from the solo duel than there is from the blind fight. Because the blind fight, once you drop into it, you just you don't know whether you're doing good or bad until everyone dies. Um, and it allows the player to still earn gold, even if they made mistakes at the start of the game. And that is that is a point that I think I'll hit a couple more times throughout these solutions, is if you start off poorly, then there needs to be some way that you can progress a little bit, just period. Even if you did everything wrong, there needs to be some small amount of progression. And the solo duel, the one versus one, could even have a much lower gold payout 
than the blind fight, to make the blind fight still a viable choice once it's unlocked. But the the one versus one is just a great a great opportunity for the player to experiment and grow and progress without nearly as much risk as the blind fight, especially with the permadeath mode. Um, in any case, so it also gives players, whenever they succeed in the arena of death, consumables that they may be able to use to win a couple of the fights in the championship, even if they just did poorly in choosing the gladiators. Nothing will frustrate a player faster than getting to the first big thing, big gameplay loop moment, and just immediately failing out. So, especially if they tinker with the arena of death or with some quests or whatever, they figure out that the main gameplay loop of the game is drop gladiators in, watch them battle. Try to win, and then they get to this championship where there's several rounds and they have to pick who to fight against. And so they pick somebody, they drop in their gladiators, and they just instantly die. And then they have to wait a full month before they can try again. It's, it's very harmful to the learning curve of the game. However, if they have consumables that they've gained from the Arena of Death, even though they had no idea what they were doing and they were just dropping in random gladiators into solo duels, they can then experiment with the consumables to at least win the first battle or two of the championship. Which, again, eases players into the experience more than just expecting them to really know what's going on. It also saves the developers a lot of tutorial time, which can also really push away players if, if they enter into a game and there's just tutorial after tutorial after tutorial. Like, just letting the player have access to these consumable items that they can figure out how they work by just dragging and dropping them onto a gladiator, and then they jump into a battle, and it said consumable, and after the battle, the consumable is gone. It's, it's very intuitive. So there doesn't need to be any kind of tutorial saying, hey, drop consumable items into your gladiator to get a temporary bonus and potentially win a battle. Like, that's, yeah, it's just, it's very intuitive. It's very self-explanatory. So giving the player access to those consumables via solo duels, for example, will help them more easily overcome the first battle or two of a championship, even if they have absolutely no idea what they're doing, which is important. It really is. Uh, giving, giving an onboarding period, for example, the first championship, where it's expected the player, even if they have no idea what they're doing, will find some level of success, no matter how small, helps retain players past the initial onboarding period. So part two of the Arena of Death changes is make the Arena of Death have a per-gladiator cooldown instead of a global cooldown. Uh, I'm actually going to, in part three, I'm going to touch on one way to program this. Um, but it should be a very simple, straightforward, and easy implementation. So this will allow the player to actually enjoy the core loop a lot more between champions and quests, championships and quests, without just having to sit and watch the calendar go by. As I mentioned in my in my issues that I raised, it's more fun to advance the calendar when you see the little cooldown on your gladiators rotating, and you see them, oh, they can't fight right now, but if I advance time for four days, six days, whatever, now they're ready to fight again, it feels much less like just downtime, and it feels like you're actually doing something, even though for all intents and purposes, you're still just clicking the play button on the timeline and watching it go by. But it feels like you're actually doing something and accomplishing something instead of just waiting for something to happen. This could be done a number of ways, and if there is a concern about uh, grinding gladiators, just simply include a per-gladiator cooldown that whenever a gladiator fights in the arena of death, whether they win or lose, they have to sit out for three days, six days, ten days, whatever, and just wiggle that around until it feels right. And um, it also, by just having the gladiators go on cooldown, even if they win, you're able to say, okay, well, you just dropped your best four gladiators into a blind fight, 
now you can't 1v1 with them for a week. That makes it so that if you want to keep playing the core loop of the game, you have to drop in a 4th or 5th or 6th or 7th gladiator that might be lower level. And it'll also allow lower level gladiators to potentially earn some gold and consumables and gain experience, rather than just taking up space on the roster and sitting on the sidelines and watching your high level gladiators do everything. And then another change that I would make to the Arena of Death is to randomize the challenges. So from what I've seen, the level of enemies in the Arena of Death is just entirely based on what championship you've completed. So if you have completed the first championship, the graveyard, then your one versus one opponents are always level three, I believe. After you complete the farm, I believe they're always level six. So this means that once you get to a certain point in the game, you've gone beyond the point where you can level up any of your level of gladiators. And once again, there's no point to having them around other than just to sell them. So by vary the challenge uh, the challenge level of the Arena of Death enemies, you are able to give low-level gladiators more of a purpose and more incentive to level a low-level gladiator up instead of just ignoring them and using your best gladiators. Especially in conjunction with having the Arena of Death or the Ring of Death have a per-gladiator cooldown, if you see a one versus one, for example, where the levels the level of the enemy is level two, you're not gonna drop in your level six gladiator to fight the level two. You're gonna drop in a level one or two gladiator. Because if the next one versus one opponent is level six or seven, and you already have your level six gladiator on cooldown, you're gonna have to just not fight in the one versus one anymore until the until the arena refreshes or your level 6 gladiator is available again. Uh, so it gives more nuance to the choice of which gladiator to drop in. This could be very useful to also include in the blind fight to let the player know before they pick blind fight what the average level of the blind fight opponents is going to be so that they know whether to drop in their team of level 1 you know, bench warmers or their best gladiators. The randomized level should include challenges that are so strong that even your best gladiators might struggle to overcome them. Especially, you know, if you're dealing with, like, permadeath. And if there's, you know, the chance that you're going to lose your best gladiator, it makes it a hard decision of whether you drop your best gladiator in to fight and risk losing him, but potentially also get him a ton of experience in this one versus one against a equal or higher level gladiator. It just it adds more depth to the arena of death. And then part four of the modification to the arena of death is just having the arena of death, instead of having it on cooldown where you can't participate, have it on the calendar to refresh on certain days so that if the challenges that are presented are too high for the player to be comfortable taking them, they're waiting for the Arena of Death to refresh to see if there's challenges they can handle, especially for permadeath mode. Because otherwise, you may end up with the Ring of Death Arena having a list of unwinnable challenges that the player is not going to want to take, and if it never refreshes, uh, you just ignore the Arena or the Ring of Death. You just wouldn't use it anymore. So it needs to refresh regularly. The blind fight to be balanced with the one versus one and the one versus many, since you don't know who you're against, uh, either needs to have a higher reward or it needs to allow you to drop in a team of gladiators if they lose, still, still know the gladiators you're fighting against. So that if you're willing to lose a team to drop in a better team, then it, you have a chance of figuring it out and using some strategy to overcome it instead of just having no clue what's going on. Or if you do really like the idea, and I'm not opposed to the idea of having a team that you have no idea what you're up against. It's just it needs to have a better reward and it needs to not be the first thing you can do. That, if anything, should be the final unlock for the Ring of Death. The first should be the one versus one, 
the second should be the one versus many, and the third should be the blind fight that has the higher reward. But again, that's just my suggestion of how to change the Ring of Death. So, suggestion B. This would completely change the game, but I think it would make it better. So after a team loses in the championship, you should be able to continue fighting in that championship. So if you lose, if you get wiped, and you're one, one battle away or two battles away from completing the championship, and you still have gladiators left, you might want to press your luck with those weaker gladiators to try to make it. And that is an interesting gameplay experience that will add so much to the experience. Instead of just, well, my best team lost, I guess I wait till the next month starts. Having that option to go, okay, my level 5s are dead, but I still have these level 1 and 2 guys. Maybe I can struggle through one or two more battles and complete the championship. That, that will give a player a story to tell. Yeah, there was this one time where my, my primary team fell, but I still had two guys left. And those two guys managed to win a two versus five fight to complete the championship. Like, that's a story to tell. Instead of just, yeah, I dropped my guys in, they won. I dropped my guys in, they won. I dropped my guys in, they lost, so I had to wait a month. You, you want to have those compelling stories people can tell about your game. It, it both increases the fun that they have while they're playing, and it gives other people a chance to hear about your game and become interested in it. And um, this, this could be implemented where the, the battle, you know, is locked in. Like, if you chose the hardest difficulty battle and your team got wiped, then you have to fight that same battle with new people. Or you could let them choose again, which would make it easier. Because then if you locked into the hardest battle and you lost, you could just lock into the easiest battle and maybe win with a weaker team. I personally would leave them locked into the battle they chose. And having to drop in new gladiators on top of the corpses of the gladiators that are already lying there that lost the last battle would be so much more interesting than just, oh, come on, championship's over, time to move on. So, I think I've stressed that point enough, um, but it, change C, especially if every suggestion I made for the arena or the Ring of Death arena is implemented, the economy of the game really needs to be changed. The cost of gladiators and the items needs to be increased so that there is more granularity allowed. So, if you have the first gladiators you buy, instead of being between 90 and 100 something gold. Instead, if they're between 200 and 400 gold, then you can have those low tier gladiators, those gladiators with absolutely horrible quirks, be 50, 60 gold. Yeah, if you're buying a gladiator that's, you know, half or a quarter of the price of the other gladiator, but for the rest of the time he's alive, he's going to have a 80% penalty to strength. Or, you know, something crazy. Like, you know, you, if you do this, you would definitely also want to ensure that there is some behind-the-scenes system to make sure that you don't get a knight that has a 80% penalty to intelligence. Which means he's literally just as good as every other non-quirk knight out there, but he's a fraction of the price. So it would require a little bit more development, a little bit more uh, time programming, and I think we will kick around different ways to do that in part three. But uh, just having the having the quirks be such a minor cost adjustment of this guy is going to permanently have thirty percent less agility, but you save ten gold. Like that's not even enough to buy a consumable item. Why would you ever buy a bad gladiator? for 10 gold less than a normal gladiator. So the, the quirk system, because of the close tie between bad quirk, normal gladiator, and good quirk, the, the price difference is so minor that unless you're just not trying to play optimally, 
you never buy a gladiator with a bad quirk. It's just it. There is no risk reward there. the The risk is you have a worse gladiator that's going to fail, and the reward is less gold than what you could buy a consumable item with. So you're better off just either not buying the gladiator and buying an item to make a good gladiator better, or buying a good gladiator. So the the entire economy, in my opinion, should be inflated, and then have more granularity so that. Consumable items are super cheap, and gladiators with horrible quirks are super cheap. So if you want to do a thrifty little bit of work to get through a championship, you buy some hot level 2, level 3 gladiators, whatever, with some horrible quirks, but you throw a bunch of consumable items on them, and they manage to f somehow make it through so that then, after the championship, you're able to buy higher level gladiators with good quirks or something along the lines. Um, especially with the permadeath mode, having the option to buy objectively bad gladiators at almost nothing is going to be a viable strategy to try to win permadeath mode. Is cut your costs as much as you can, and if these gladiators with terrible quirks die, as long as they win a battle, you get your gold back. Like, the, the options that you're given as the developer if you inflate the economy and give more increments to it and, and give more granularity to exactly what stuff costs, the more interesting the overworld economy portion of the game becomes. And there's all obviously a problem if buying a gladiator with a permanent good quirk is only a potion's more, you know, expensive. For example, there's a quirk that gives you a 1% increase of your primary stat whenever you block an attack. So that means if your knight has 40 strength, just tossing something out, and every time they block, they get 1% of that. So they're getting like half a strength every time they block. But if their block is half a second, that means they're gaining one strength per second, and as long as the battle lasts more than five or six seconds, that's already better than the consumable you could have bought. Especially since that's going to be there for every battle they ever fight. So even if each battle is only one second, and they only gain one strength per battle, as soon as they've fought eight battles, the quirk has paid for itself in terms of consumables that you could have bought with that money instead. The loan system that I suggested before, being tied to the bank, it's it's a way to make the higher cost of gladiators worth or like uh, eat more easily balanced and gives you time to adjust things more more smoothly. It would also a loan system would allow a permadeath run to be salvaged if every one of your gladiators dies. So. If the loan amount scales throughout the game and you get to the fourth championship and every one of your gladiators gets killed, especially if you have the option to continue fighting and continue fighting after you lose a battle, and you just wipe your entire roster and you get, you know, some gold back, but you can only afford to buy two gladiators with it. If you can take out a loan and buy a full roster of gladiators with the understanding that you're going to be paying essentially for four times, or, you know, two times the number of gladiators, you can save a run that would have otherwise been lost. Perhaps by playing safer with the new gladiators than you did with the other ones because you got overconfident after success after success. So, the economy uh, being inflated and then divided into more tiers of quirks and items would be a step in the right direction. Obviously increasing starting gold as well, if you're going to increase the cost of gladiators just in general, would be a good idea. Unless you want players to be forced to buy gladiators with bad quirks at the start of the game, which is entirely viable. You can, you can put gladiators in the market and tell the player, you can't afford any of these good people, or you can afford to buy one good gladiator, or you can buy a full team of gladiators with these horrible quirks. That is a viable way to start the game, and it, again, is a more interesting decision than just, I have 600 gold, a gladiator that's level 2 that has no quirk is a 
what, a fifth of that? So I can buy five level two gladiators with no quirk. Or I can buy... Is that even six? I don't even think you can get a sixth gladiator if you buy gladiators that are level two with bad quirks with your starting gold. My point is just the difference between different tiers of items and gladiators needs to be more pronounced. Otherwise, there's no point to having them. And then this, this entire block of text here uh, is my suggestion that a scaling system for stats that guides the player to make more meaningful decisions is a really good idea. So this in part fixes the agility issue of agility just being good on everyone all the time. Um, so if the cooldown and execution time have different scaling and scale with different stats, then you can point the player towards a particular stat. Like if you want the Berserker to primarily be a strength-based combatant, have his cooldown and execution time at least in part based on strength. If they hover over every stat and they see that every stat has strength and every stat, no matter how little or how much, benefits from, st from strength, they're going to know, okay, this gladiator is good when I put strength into it. And it also allows players like me who like to, you know, go into a game, min-max, pull up spreadsheets and compare and contrast what the most optimal thing to do in this particular situation is, it gives us something more to play with if there's more adjustments. So this goes back to the, the Dungeons & Dragons example of the primary stat, the secondary stats, and then the dump stats. So in this example, if we're giving a knight a primary stat of um, health and a secondary stat of strength and agility, and then say, movement or intelligence, or no, if, if movement's the dump stat, because I do use intelligence here. So if their melee attack increases damage based on strength, agility, and health, and their execution time is based on strength and health, and their cooldown is based on health and agility, then if they're distributing stats on level up, each point, each, each stat increase, when you click the up arrow on the stat, by clicking strength, you gain 15 damage and uh, 25 hundredths of execution time. If you click agility, you gain 10 damage, but you gain 375 thousandths of cooldown time. And if you click health, you gain 15 damage, a fraction of execution time, and a fraction of cooldown time. But neither of those is better than the strength or agility. Now, obviously, this, this is just a spitball. This is not in any way balanced because buying health does give you effective health. However, we can slightly address that by looking at shield block. Now, if the block amount is based on strength and agility and intelligence, because the smarter you are, the better you are at it gauging how you should angle the shield or whatever. If the execution time is based on strength and health, and the cooldown is based on health, agility, and intelligence, then putting a each time you click Strength, you're gaining 0 0.025 execution time and 15 block, val uh, block amount. Agility would be 5 block amount, but 0 0.0375 cooldown time. So you go Strength if you want faster blocks, and you go Agility if you want more frequent blocks. Or you go with Health, which gives you no block because it's Health, it doesn't need to give you a effective Health. But it, increase or it decreases the execution and cooldown time of the block. And then if intelligence also increases block and reduces cooldown time, then you can put an item, say, that gives agility and intelligence onto this gladiator without it being bad, without the stat being a waste. Unless, of course, you wanted to make intelligence the dump stat for the knight, in which case, obviously, putting an item that has intelligence on him would be a waste of stats, but might be viable in some situations. So, in this situation, in this example, if you wanted to prioritize damage, you'd decide between strength and health. If you're interested in executing the attacks and blocks as quickly as possible, you would need strength or health, with strength being more effective. And if you wanted to reduce the cooldown to attack and block as frequently as possible, you would need agility or health, with agility being the most effective. So, 
no matter what you pick, unless you pick movement or stamina, your stats are getting better. Your your abilities are getting better. Which you can then use to adjust things much more. There's there's a lot more levers there. There's a lot more values there that you can adjust to balance things. And yeah, the, the idea is that you just want meaningful choices whenever you're gearing up and leveling up a character. Whether it be a single player RPG where you have a single character that you're leveling up. Or if you've got any kind of strategic game where you have an entire army, you want leveling and gearing up your forces to be an interesting series of decisions. And even if you don't want to appeal to people like me who like to min-max and spreadsheet things, it still gives more casual players an opportunity to mess around and have fun and maybe have that super intelligent night just for the fun of it. So it makes it friendlier to casual players as well. And I do believe that some of the execution time and cooldown scaling needs to at least partially include stats other than agility. Because even if none of those previous changes were made, just having nothing but agility to determine execution time and cooldown is a major problem. It, it horribly breaks the balance between the different stats up until you get each gladiator up to agility cap. Once you get to the cap of how fast you can execute and how frequently you can execute an ability, agility is just the best because it multiplicatively scales with whatever the flat raw amounts that the ability does. So, in this example, very simple, just add in. You already have the ability to have multiple stats cause scaling, because the knight has strength and agility scaling on, its, on, on the damage of its attack. So just do that to the cooldown time and execution time as well. In this example, right now, if you put 20 points of agility into a knight, his execution time and cooldown time is reduced by about 0.2 seconds. And he gains 60 damage. So my suggestion would be change it so that just, again, spitballing numbers just to give an example. Instead of a 0 .01 scaling for agility, have a 0 .0095 scaling. So in this, in this situation, if the player decides to put 20 points of agility into the knight, he gets a slightly lesser effect, a, a 0.19 instead of 0.2 on his cooldown, but he still gets 60 damage. If he splits it, 15 agility and 5 strength, he will get a .1425 cooldown reduction and execution time improvement from the agility, as well as a .025 from the strength. So you can see, by trading out one level up from agility to strength, you've lost .0325 from the current 20 agility. But you also, instead of doing 60 damage, you get 70 damage. And you also gain 35 block value. And then if you decide to go agility 5 and strength 15, it's a similar effect. You get more damage, more block, and a lesser amount of cooldown and execution time. And even if you go full strength, you still get some cooldown and execution time reduction as well as the most damage and the most block you could get for a level up. So that makes the decision of do I put strength or agility into the knight more interesting. Because if you put in agility, 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 you'll get to that cooldown and execution time cap faster, but then every point of strength you put in after that is giving you less and less than it could have. Whereas if you just go nothing but strength, you're giving up on getting to that agility, the, the cooldown and execution time cap as quickly as possible. So it takes you twice as long to get to the execution time and cooldown cap, but you're increasing your flat amounts faster. And this way you would get multiplicative results and flat results on your block as compared to with Agility, you would only get multiplicative results. So just adding in one stat other than agility is enough to already fix, at least for the most part, the 
problem with agility being the strongest stat at the moment up until you get to execution and cooldown cap. Party. Consumables. Need to be usable even if the player has permanent items in all of the gladiator slots. Otherwise, they're just cell fodder. And higher level... I, I, there are higher tiers of consumable items in the game, but by the time you start getting them, you already have your best gladiators fully decked out. So you don't use them. But if there was a consumable only slot, if there was a single item slot, and it could even be one of the item slots that's already there, but having a slot that's consumables only makes sure that the player always has a use for consumables. No matter how much gold they have, no matter how far along in the game they are, they always have a use for consumables if there's a consumable only slot. Now, players who have already been playing the beta may complain if one of the item slots that's currently available gets turned into a consumable-only slot, because that is effectively reducing the raw power that their gladiator has in exchange for making consumables viable to keep around. So, ideally, since you're already in a beta, you would probably want to have an additional consumable-only slot. And then, uh, and on that topic, before I move on, it, it's already coded into your game that consumables are different than permanent items. And that functionality could just be expanded to only allow that type of item into the slot. You could even leave it where you could put consumables in every item slot, but just flag one particular slot as no permanent items and problem solved. Uh, moving on, I believe this is the last suggestion I have. Increasing the item variety will be such a massive, massive boon to this game. It will fix so many problems, and it will, it will increase the pushing your luck aspect of the economic simulation. So, if you have a variety, a larger variety of items that are more granular in their improvements. All of a sudden, do you want to hold on to that plus 10 item and skip over the plus 12, the plus 15, whatever it is, to get to the next better one? Or do you just go with the smallest upgrade just because it's an upgrade as often as you can? This is, this is something that, especially computer RPGs, CRPGs, have been doing for a long, long time. You may go to a shop and see something that gives you a plus one to whatever. And you currently have nothing. But in the same shop, you see something that gives you a plus two to the same thing. Do you save up for the plus two? Or do you buy the plus one to make it easier to get the money to get the plus two? And that is an interesting decision in and of itself. So the easiest way to do this, the easiest way to, to fix the item issue, the, the all of the item issues really, as far as consumables not really being worth anything and permanent items just you buy it and forget it. You if you get if you get an item that gives you plus 30 intelligence, you just buy that item, stick it in your gladiator and forget it exists. Whereas if throughout the entire game there were gradual increases. And I have an example here. And this could be tier 1 and tier 2 unlocked by the start of the game or just tier 1 unlocked at the start of the game. Either way, being able to buy 10 plus 8 for the price of 1 plus 5 makes the consumables so much more interesting. Because that means that with those consumables, you'll be able to have a higher bonus going through the first championship than if you just bought the permanent, bo the permanent item. Which would then let you get to the next tier where you could actually buy a permanent item that gives a better boost than the lowest tier consumable. However, at that tier, you would have a consumable that's even more powerful. So you have the option 
of always having the highest bonus possible by using nothing but consumables, and that is viable up until you lose a championship. And as soon as you lose a championship, all the consumables you lost, all the consumables you used up until you lost are gone. So then you're stuck deciding, do I buy more consumables and try it again, or do I buy some permanent items and try it again? And if you lose with permanent items, you didn't lose anything. You, you still have just as many stats as you did going in. So you can just try again without having to invest any more gold. It's, it gives the consumable versus permanent aspect more of a risk-reward if the consumable is able to give you a one-time objectively better upgrade. Because right now, when you start the game, you can get a consumable for plus 8 agility that costs 15 gold, or you can pay 105, and you can get a permanent plus 10. So, not only does it last for more battles, but it is just better. Unless you're drinking two of the agility potions per battle, in which case, the permanent is, yes, it's plus 10 against plus 16, but for the price of, what is that even? Eight potions? Yeah, I, I think that's, no wait, nine. Something like that. In any case, the, the idea is you are permanently losing gold every time you use a consumable. Whereas the permanent item, if it gives you a bigger bonus, and then later you can sell it to buy an even better item, there's no incentive to buy consumables ever. And there's barely cons there's barely incentive to use consumables when they're given to you for free, as long as there's not a consumable only slot. So that's just what I've kicked around there, and the the primary thing to think about with an item system like Gladiator Guild Manager has, at least in its current beta form, is that whenever you have anything that does similar things. There always needs to be some kind of interesting decision between the two of them. If there's no interesting decision, if one or the other answer is always the right answer, there's no point in having both things. Like, if you're playing rock, paper, scissor, except rock just always wins, there's no point to having scissor or paper. You might as well just have everyone throw rock, everyone tie all the time, it's a boring game. If there's no decision to be made, it takes a lot of a lot of strength out of any game. So, that being said, those those are my suggestions for how to improve in my opinion or at least change Gladiator Guild Manager to make it a more interesting game. And now part 3 is going to be just to show that some of these implementations, some of these changes could be done fairly easily, cheaply, and quickly without breaking much of anything. Unless the, the game has a lot of interdependencies that make no sense. Um, I will be making some assumptions during part three, and they may be right, they may be wrong, but regardless, I'll be giving examples of how to do many of the things that I've just gone through discussing. But that will be part three, so... Until then, I hope you have a good one.